Welcome to the Decolonizing Education YouTube channel. Today we're talking about the importance of creative arts in education and we have three special guests. I'm going to start off by asking each of you to just introduce yourselves, tell the world who you are and why creative arts are important to you. Martin, do you want to start us off? Yeah, um, Martin Glynn, um, 63 this year. I've been I've been a practicing artist from I was six years of age, so it's it's I, nearly six decades. Um, I'm a writer, I'm a poet, uh, spoken word artist, data storyteller, and I've worked in over two thousand schools around the world. My stuff's done on the national curriculum. Um, but primarily, I, I just see myself as somebody that uses language to inspire and empower and change stuff. And the relevance of the arts is, is quite simple, that the arts historically is one of the only forms of communication that's universal. Uh, it's more truthful. It's not bogged down of organized politics. But more importantly, um, if it wasn't for the arts, I'd be dead because my whole emotional and psychological well-being is predicated on me discharging what's going on inside my head. And I'm fortunate that I've been blessed over the five, six, nearly six decades with this, with this gift. So it's, it's, it's personal, it's political, and it's emotional, but I don't separate the three. They're all connected. Brilliant. Thank you. Desiree? Um, hello. Thanks for inviting me Moona. I've been saying yes to doing one of these things for how long and we're getting to it now which uh, <laughs> is good. Um, I'm Desiree, I am uh, a writer just about coming towards the end of a fight with my second novel um, and I'm also a trustee at the Racial Justice Network so hi Loki because <laughs> we've been meaning to hook up with you for a while now who is a patron so um, I'm really glad to be able to connect with everyone. Um, and obviously Martin and I have hooked up before and done panels and stuff together. Um, I think um, the importance of the creative arts um, in terms of education for me is really quite, it's, it's important on quite a few different levels. So on one level, um, I'm a writer, obviously. I had one of those kind of dysfunctional family uh, upbringings um, and I writing became an escape for me much the way that Martin has said about just getting rid of stuff in his head um, and we can talk a little bit more about that later but also um, in terms of um, education now I'm also the mother of two very creative uh, young men and um, both are autistic and therefore the arts um, present something that uh, mainstream education don't do they don't do anymore when I was at school we did drama I don't know whether there's even a drama department anymore in certain schools anyway there was music um, as well as art and I don't think that's the same in schooling right now so the importance of it now in particular is is can't can't be can't be over stipulated and the the what it shows to me is that if we're talking about drama's not there anymore talking about music as a thing, it's not there as a thing, it might be there as a special thing, but not there as a standard thing, then the system is broken and it's been broken for, for quite a long time. Some really important points there that we're gonna come back to. And Loki? Um, I'll just turn it off mute. Um, it's really nice to be here and to talk with all of you. And I just wanna, um, really give my biggest respect to you Mona, on this um, initiative. It's really important and I hope that it continues after we have come out of these uh, conditions. I'm a hip hop artist, um, Salvador Allende, the overthrown uh, leader of Chile in 1973, September 11th, described himself as an interpreter of yearnings for justice. And I would say that that is what I aspire to do. And then, through music, I think that, as Martin made the point, you have an ability to speak to any person on the stratification of society through the music that generally in day-to-day -day situations, you won't have the opportunity to do. Montavar Zaidi, the Iraqi journalist who threw his shoe 
at George Bush was breaking the sort of invisible screen that existed between Iraqis and US politicians. Now through the music, it's that kind of spirit that I'm trying to um, feed. We also have to be clear that hip hop as an industry in the United States is worth over a trillion dollars a year easily to the US economy. In terms of the 200 largest economy, uh, largest um, uh, economic powers in the world, 200, um, uh, about over 170 of them are corporations. Some of those corporations are involved in the music business. There is an extent to which we can view our music sometimes as being benign, but actually it is educating people towards a certain way of viewing the world. And Augusto uh, Boal in Theatre of the Oppressed put it this way. He said, the ruling class are the people with the means to propagate their ideas to the greatest level of success. And often, whether it is through the arts, whether it's through theatre, whether it's through film, they're able to quite effectively do that. And so what I would say um, I am trying to do is assert collective will through my music, give coherence to political ideas. Um, one of the things that the artist Peter Kennard said, he said the music on its own is limited in terms of its political use. And I do make no bones about my music having political aims, but he says when it's allied with political movements, it can have a greater potential uh, for success. Though at the same time, if you uh, use a kind of narrow ideology when making your music, it can also have limitations too. So it's kind of walking a fine balance along that line, um, challenging the powerful in society, exposing them as much as possible, and making audible, um, not necessarily voiceless people, but people that are purposely unheard and are marginalized by the mainstream media, which is controlled by the mega powerful uh, today. So that's why I attempt to do through the music. The importance in education is that, so you know, one of the examples I was gonna to point to there, um, uh, Muhammad Jamjoum were Fuad Hijazi, they were two uh, Palestinian rebels that in the uprising against the British occupation in the thirties were imprisoned and executed. Now, I personally, despite being someone who'd been invested in learning about the Palestinian tragedy for a lot of my life, hadn't heard of these two gentlemen's names. It was only upon hearing the folklore, um, the song, Min Sijin Akka, that I learned about these people because it was a song that was sung and the, the, the words were kind of immortalized in that way. So I think in terms of educating people, in terms of documenting history in a bottom-up way, not in a top-down way, there is great potential through music. And I myself would say that have been able to kind of fashion a political education partly through exposure to these ideas in the arts. Brilliant. Thank you guys so much for joining me today, coming from very different perspectives, but I think the shared thing, the shared common theme in what all of you have said so far is the fact that art represents a particular reality and it's used to represent a particular reality. So when we're talking about art in the movement of decolonizing education, what aspects of reality are not made visible or represented within the education system that art could possibly allow us to start to incorporate? So what is it about art that allows us to capture particular realities and how do we now take those into the, the classroom space? can jump in. Um, I, I'm going to start with, because just for everybody's benefit, my new book is called Black Art and the Criminological Imagination. I was one of the people involved in the radical black arts movement in the 70s in the UK, very heavily influenced by the African-American black arts movement in the 60s. So very heavily involved in theatre, music and stuff like this. Um, I'm of the opinion that takes place everywhere and one of the questions is whether or not education in the way that it's practiced here is a site and a space that is available for the production of people's truths. Um, 
it's it's very interesting. People talk drill and trap. Well, if you study Shakespeare, it's every bit as violent, every bit as misogynistic. Um, most modern swear words in the UK come from Shakespeare. Yet when a youth talks about his reality, somewhere everybody he says that's wrong, but then goes and watch Martin Scorsese movies. So I also feel that within our society, that the arts, as I, I'm making an argument in my book, that it has a truer reflection, not just in responding to modern or the conditions of now, but it's one of the few spaces where the ancestral connection from the past is brought into the future. Because I, as, as a 60 year old, I, I was lied to for most of my years. And on that basis, art became a way for me to research, rediscover, redefine, all of that. And I would say that from slavery, from colonialism, any fight for struggles, whether it's reggae music, calypso, soca, hip hop, you know, it's, it's also about freedom. I mean, I, it, I wouldn't have learned about slavery if it wasn't for the blues. I wouldn't have learned about the Alabama bombing if it wasn't for John Coltrane's Alabama. I wouldn't have learned the situation if it wasn't for the theater of August Wilson. So for me, when I decided to start my journey as an artist, my mom told me one thing. She told me before she died or when, when she was alive to meet everybody in the world. And in 60 odd years, I've impacted over 100 million people from these platforms over a 60 odd year period. So I know that when I'm ready to pass away, the one thing that's critical for most artists is the legacy you leave behind attained the kind of legacy that I, I never thought I was going to do. So for me, and I, and I go back to Loki and Desiree, you know, and yourself, we're kind of united by a common passion for art, but we're separated by age, distance, and all sorts of stuff. But the one thing we have in common, and that's something that white people, black people, nobody can take away. So I also think that art is possibly one of the most unifying things in the world. At so if you put food, drink, and art together, people don't want to go home because they are the three things that people love. So I, for me, I think that the way we produce art, the way we occupy space is political when you're denied access. But from a point of view of liberation of the truth and the translation within a society that needs change, any revolutionary struggle, art becomes the way in which that is transmitted. So, so my own position is very, very much as revolutionary uh, outcomes. And that could be the revolution of love. That could be the revolution of sensitivity. It's not just the revolution of social transformation and change and, and that, but it's about the transformative power of what we do and actually placing value and protecting those people that are the ancestral connection personified. Thank you. Does anybody else want to come in? Sorry, Mona, can you just remind me what the question was? Yeah, so I was saying when we think about art as a representation of reality, what realities are allowed into the classroom? And what can we do as part of the decolonizing movement to bring to use art as a way of bringing in other realities that are silenced? So the reason I bring that up is because there are movements like hip hop ed in the states at the moment that talk about culturally relevant pedagogy and the use of hip hop to not just change the way that young people view education, but allows them to bring their stories into the classroom. So I just wanted to know what your views are on the role of art in creating those spaces. Well, an interesting, an interesting anecdote that I would have linking to that was in 2011, I went to Venezuela um, at the invitation of the Venezuelan government at the time when Hugo Chavez was um, in the process of having chemotherapy for his cancer. And I connected with a group of guys called Hip Hop Revolution. Now, they were 
um, young people from the barrios who had been, in terms of intergenerationally, um, deeply disenfranchised by the political process. When Chavez came in, he had on a weekly basis, if I remember correctly, a show called Allo Presidente, where people would be able to call in and speak to him directly over the phone and complain about issues they had, and he would find his way to ameliorate those issues. Now, one time they invented the guy, they invited the guys onto the show um, to do a performance. And so what this group of young men, disaffected young men did, was challenge the president live on TV and say to him that there's serious issues of corruption right now and we need it to be dealt with, we need it to be fixed. Now, what Chavez did, he didn't imprison them, he didn't censor them, he didn't muzzle them, he funded and, pa and patronized a project all across the country to set up hip hop schools that would help people with um, issues which were relative to their daily life. And I was really greatly inspired by that and thought that would be something good to, to happen here in a way that hip hop was the vehicle to relate directly to people's daily um, needs. And of course, we know that as of 2009, at least the State Department was funding through um, an arts organization in Cuba subversive artists that were seeking to um, encourage revolt against the government there. It's very likely that the State Department have used similar stuff in Venezuela and other parts of Latin America. So in that way, you can see that art is a contested space. It can also be drawn in one direction and it can also spring from a different direction. I think in terms of decolonial education, when we understand how a place that is limited in terms of land mass, limited in terms of population, limited in terms of resources, was able to become the world's number one economy for what is relatively a short blip in human history. One of the important things about decolonial education is while thinking critically about that period of time and the way that it affects the present and the way that those dynamics of power affect the way we relate to each other now, we should not consecrate it or eternalize that power dynamic. History did not start with the East India Company. And at the time when the East India Company was founded, you look at the share of the world economy that this country had in relation to places like India and China, it was literally dwarfed. And Pankaj Mushra put it this way, when uh, Britain started coming out to the rest of the world, they were perceived largely as barbarians, as culturally inferior, mm -hmm. as backwards. The type of economy that Britain were uh, building in the 1600s was very, very similar in terms of level to what the Chinese already had in the 12th century. You're talking about the Chinese having uh, steel production a millennium and a half before Britain, having printed press half a millennium before um, Britain. These things are relevant to understanding the ascent of this um, entity that we know um, and that we are part of today. And now understanding its descent in power, which is what we are living through. And that's going to be fast forwarded. We're going to see a real free fall off the back of this um, pandemic that we are seeing. What I think is important for young people to learn here, and I'm not just talking about those of us who consider ourselves to have proximity to the victims of the British Empire, of British imperialism, I'm also talking about people who identify with being English and being British. If we were actually to uh, unpick and to deconstruct a lot of English language, it would tell a story which is different. We would be able to excavate the past. So if we look at the word pajamas, where does it come from? It comes from British presence in India and is a word that was loaned into English. We look at a word, a word like algorithms. And one of the things that struck me actually about our conversation so far was previously a way to censor people would be to burn books. Okay, we know this happened. Now you have a way to algorithmically discriminate against people. 
um, by the, you know, the gods of Silicon Valley who are deeply embedded within the securitocracy in the United States. Everyone on Facebook, right, which is bigger than the population of any country, including China, all of their information is visible to the US government because Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook are very, very open and acquiesce freely to the US security state. Yeah. Back to the word algorithms, the root of it is the word al-Khawarizmi. Who was al-Khawarizmi? He was a polymath who was Persian originally, but did his thinking in Baghdad. And we're talking about the, the around a thousand years ago, he was estimating the circumference of the globe. This was a time where the consensus in Western Europe, definitely, and Europe generally, was that the world was flat. And because of his contributions, not only to uh, mathematics, to astronomy, he um, today has a crater named after him on the moon. And because of the mark that he left, today you have algorithms as a, a, a manifestation in the English language of his name, al Khawarizmi. Mm. And there's many words. You look at the way that we use canon to refer to a bunch of essential books that everybody needs to read. Where does that come from? It comes from the book of Qanun by Ibn Sina, which was, uh, of course, another person who did his thinking in Baghdad about a thousand years ago, but that today, um, uh, but at that time, the book of Qanun was used as a, a curriculum in uh, medical studies until the 16th century in Europe. That's how far ahead it was of a society which, you know, according to Oxford scholars, bathing was a heathen practice. So if we're going to start to decolonize our history, we're going to start looking not only at the fingerprints that Britain left on the rest of the world, mm. um, Ngugi with the Ongo refers to it as the metaphysical empire. So the, the schooling system, the language of government being English, of course, stuff like the IMF and the World Bank still having such a control over the economies of so many places in the world and the United States being the only people with the veto power at the IMF and controlling the World Bank, that is a leftover of Anglo-Saxon projection of power. Yes, we look at the borders, yes. But let's actually think of another way in which the colonial project has left its fingerprints on people here. One of the things that I often say is quite difficult to do as uh, somebody who has grown up here and is a hybridized Iraqi, I would say that we have, you know, Iraq has been invaded and occupied by the British at least three times across the last hundred years, all right? At least three times. So it's quite hard to decolonize that relationship. However, if you were to go to the British Museum, that we all know is a collection of stolen artifacts. One coin there, which will really lead a lot of young Iraqis to view their perception of Britain slightly differently, is um, a coin that was struck at the time when England was a hepatarchy, or was believed to have been a hepatarchy, seven kingdoms. Um, king Offa was an Anglo-Saxon king of Middle England, and he struck a coin in the 700s. Now written on that coin, is the words, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Why was this word, were these words written in Arabic on a coin that was exchanged here? The reason was that was in order to trade with Baghdad, you had a king here having to create an imitation coin. Now this is a relationship which is not all about British power over people in Iraq. And it's from the Abbasid period. You look at the word rice, it's from Rus in Arabic because agriculturally they were developing rice in, um, obviously it had been developed in East Africa prior to it being developed in, in, in the Abbasid um, empire, but that was how it came to England. Like the word philosophy, it came from Greek and then from Greek, philosophia, love of wisdom, into Arabic, falsafa, and then from Arabic into um, Latin and English, philosophy. We have alternatives, alternative ways of viewing things while acknowledging the fingerprints that colonialism has left on us all. And I think that would be beneficial to everybody in this country if they were to view these kind of things more critically. So, yeah, I think etymology would be a good way to do it. Absolutely. And, and Desiree, what are your thoughts? <laughs> oh, my gosh, that was so full. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think 
uh, I, I, there is no disagreement from me at all from for, for any of the things that both Martin and Loki have said. I think the, 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 the difficulties for me sometimes is with decolonial. I just, I'm just a little bit tired of the word. I kind of feel like we, what happens with these theories is that they end up being kind of the, the lived experience of the word gets sucked out of it. And then we come, then another theory gets brought into play. Um, and that's also about, you know, Western ideologies and white supremacy and patriarchy. Um, so I do have problems with you being, what do we mean by decolonial? What do we mean by colonial? Because it hits people in different ways. Is that too? And then what do we mean by art on top of that? So one person's art is somebody else's rubbish. Um, as, as both Martin and Loki have mentioned hip hop quite a lot about hip hop and reggae, both being music of resistance for, for many, many years. Um, and what that meant for the youth, um, listening to it and buying it and sharing it and playing records when records was in fashionable, fashionable back in them days. Um, but the way, the way I think I can think about this is about myself um, and how, that I, how do I live that life or how do I teach in that way? How do, how do I get young people that I teach? I teach creative writing, which is what I didn't say before. Um, how do I get them to think about deconstructing what they are being given as an idea of what what the thing is when it's not the thing it's one of many things and um one of the ways I do it because I teach literature and I think about literature <laughs> quite a lot and I and I like like trying to kind of unpack what what I do is that for instance I don't in my writing I don't describe women's bodies I do not describe how people look because we are subjected to kind of western beauty notions that are completely irrelevant and wrong i do not do, i do not use people's body parts to denote a story so they're not if they're fat they're not lazy if they're thin they're not mean those are the things that you kind of can talk to in a, in a classroom where you're teaching creative writing is why why are you saying that what does that mean what are you saying about somebody's character that they say I, i've written a paper about beauty how being beautiful is considered a characteristic especially in a lot of fiction written by women and 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 beauty being something that derives a story forward um you know like she was beautiful therefore it then then means that action can happen because she's this or she's that or she's light skin or she's what you know thin and whatever so um in that way applying it to my own practice i try to get rid of all of that um, I try to think about character in a way that's about feeling and emotion um, and about driving the narrative forward and coming to a place where you and your reader have an understanding. You might disagree with me and that's cool, mm. but you and I understand each other a little bit more now. So I think that's, that's, quite, that's quite important. Mm. Um, all the other stuff about, I don't know. I mean, I find even in education, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, the whole master's tools thing. Can we just tear it all down? Can we just start again? Um, I would like to think so. I do think that we're going to come out of COVID a very different people, but I'm a bit of a pessimist. Um, I would like to think that it means that, I mean, I'm, you know, working with the Racial Justice Network and seeing what we're doing and what we're trying to do. Um, and working with some amazing people and how COVID is affecting the migrant communities and what we want to try and get across to people that are kind of isolating in relative luxury, that kind of thing. Um, that gives me hope. But in terms of structurally, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think what was really important for me and everything that the three of you have said is that art comes in so many different forms. But what I really appreciated that you looked at was beyond the art itself, the mechanisms that we use in creating that art, whether it's the, the choice to not include descriptions of imagery for you, Desiree, or Loki talking about the importance of honing in on the language that we use and really thinking critically about where that language actually comes from and seeing the messages within the messages that we're receiving, particularly within the education system. And it just brings me back to a quote by um, James Baldwin, who said that art is a confession. And I'm just really interested in your thoughts on this idea that 
when we look at education, we only see what is presented to us and that there is the opportunity through incorporating art and creativity that we can actually find the gaps and find the spaces and find the stories that are in front of us, but we're not actually seeing because they're clouded by something. So that idea that art can actually create some sort of space for confession. What are your thoughts on that? Desiree, do you want to start us off? Um, thanks, Muna. <laughs> um, I think, uh, I love James Baldwin. I love, I mean, he's, he's, he's difficult in other ways, but yeah, I do think that what, that about it being a confession, but also I think it's a, it's a kind of, I think good art is a witness to, um, yeah. and, and it's there to kind of hold to account, uh, to, to describe, what isn't it, what is undescribable is something that uh, I think Tony Morrison said. Describe the undescribable, um, and and that and those are the ways that we can do that. I mean, in a classroom, or where I teach in community settings, where we're asking people to to on one hand think about themselves. Like I taught that thing I think about the writing is resistance uh, for the uni, uh, uni of chef that the 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 idea of thinking not about your own little tiny thing but widening it out so young people are fighting them on their end it's like well what's happening now we can I, I see that but what else is happening what's happening to your grandparents what's happening to your cousin what's happening to what happened to the generations before you and therefore linking and in the way that loki is described and martin actually but the way in kind of taking it down to the personal and linking it all together. But I do think that art's function is, is primarily a witness. I think mm -hmm. if you then take that out of what art can do, then you can, you can, I'm not saying always, but you can fall into propaganda then, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the amazingly beautiful posters um, done at, at the rise of fascism in Germany in the thirties. Those posters are beautiful, mm -hmm. but art was then used for a tool uh, for propaganda and we have to be mindful of that but I think yeah I think I'm uh, repeating myself but yes I think it is about uh, being a witness. Martin what are your thoughts? I mean, for me I my art practice has changed as I get older the concerns that I have now is not what I had when I was in my 20s um, where I'm at right now is very much around embodied practice how do I inhabit myself um, as you know, three years ago, when I got diagnosed with a prostate issue, it completely changed my life. I had to confront and witness myself. And having worked in prisons for 40 odd years, most of the people I've worked with have been stripped of everything. So there's a huge, huge amount of recon people to begin to say, who am I? And most people don't have a space to do that. And in school, because of the curriculum, it's even more restricted. So a bit like Desiree, um, as an older person who's now doing a lot of intergenerational work, I believe it's about, I, for me, it's about how do you embody yourself? And so I also use a lot of visual stimulus. I work with a lot of blind people who their, their power of imagery transcends my mind because I sometimes write what I see. Whereas when I've worked with people with other senses, what I realize is how inadequate my own sense of embodiment is. So I see it as a way of connecting the dots of which I'm just a dot and you put all the dots together to make a whole. I mean, in my early years of when I went to Northern Ireland and I went to Germany when the Berlin War, you know, when I did a lot of that, I really felt there was a purpose to it. And then I became ill. I started to get heart problems. I started to get get uh, emotional and psychological problems and then what I realized is my art had to kind of reflect what was going on inside out and then I discovered when you talk about what's going on inside they think they want to section you and then I discovered arts in mental health when I was angry then I would discover arts to take care of you're an angry black person here's black history month so now I'm approaching this phase of my life what I realize is, is that young people and myself included are still in an embodied state. And a lot of that times, 
like Tony Morrison, it doesn't involve society. I can tell you being in a house with a wife who is a diabetic. Every time I step out of the house, I have dread feelings. But what I realize is that's because the thing that I'm scared of most is the very thing that is going to happen regardless. And I struggle with that sector, which is death. And so as a 60 year old with a prostate issue and kids, grandkids and a great grandchild, that I've kind of become and have less restrictions on what my expression of art should be. Because I think for a lot of young people, we talk about the freedom of expression. School suppresses that. So if there's one thing to create a counter narrative, it's to create safe spaces for people to occupy space and embody it and arrive at, at, there's all sorts of destinations people arrive at. And I'm saying that we forget sometimes within the life course. What you wrote about when you was 10 and 20 and 30, and I find out as I'm pushing towards 70, that I increasingly are more philosophical. So I'm more liable to write about a raindrop in a death, uh, like a friend of mine is in death row. And he wrote a story about a raindrop because he hadn't had rain in his cell for a year. He's, he's in California. And he wrote a story about what he could see in the raindrop. And it helped him cope with being locked up 23 hours a day. And uh, just to conclude on that, a friend of mine called Willard, um, who's one of the world's, he creates the world's smallest sculptors, said that he's, he said, there's nothing bigger than something small. So what I found is my writing and my creativity boils down to very, very, very small things, small movements, small sounds. But in doing that, there's a magnification when people think, I didn't realize you valued silence. I didn't realize you valued small things. So for me, embodied practice and embedding embodied practice in difficult spaces is what I've been doing for most of my life. And school, I know when I go into school and I've got a white beard, to young people it means something. And so therefore, rather than me talk about, you know, fight the teacher, uh, you know, and get kicked out of school, what I get them to talk about is, who is the influential person in your life who's got a beard that looks like this? And when they talk about their grandfather, or they talk about somebody that they remember, those memories come back at a time when they felt safe to just be. But so I, like W.E.B. Du Bois' double consciousness, young people occupy several different states of being. Some of them are precarious and unsafe, but others, we as older elders, can assist in bringing that young person to a point of safety and comfort in the middle of that difficult situation and give them some tools and ideas to enable them to navigate because I'm not in a school with that young person, but we can give them the tools to navigate it the way when we're in university, we were given tools to navigate the white space. And, and so I, like Amiri Baraka, when you're faced with this phase of your life and you've got a serious illness, you have to come to terms and then say, what can art do for me? And what it does, it takes me away from thinking about death constantly. And so therefore, if that's what it is at this moment in time, I've done my 40 odd years as a, at that apprenticeship. My apprenticeship now is to prepare myself for a different journey without going crazy or committing suicide or feeling that I'm not good enough. And I realize that I am good enough and I'm using creativity to, for me now. Yeah. So yeah, that, and, that's and, my and, and, and that And that really resonates, particularly your point around the, the curriculum and the way that the school is structured, suppressing those expressions for young people and them seeking out safe spaces and art transcends space but for them to be able to find a particular art that they connect with and create that as a safe space for themselves is is hugely important and I use that in a lot of the youth work that I do as well so that really connected with me. Loki. Wow thank you so much for sharing that Martin. Um, I wish you nothing but strength brother. In terms of the situation of the curriculums in schools we had somebody coming forward and saying he would curriculumize study of the british empire um and the way that he was demonized actually upon that basis because one of the important people to study in the canon on british colonialism 
as an economic enterprise is Walter Rodney and how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Tom Bauer's book about Jeremy Corbyn called Dangerous Hero, which was clearly um, sourced from no doubt information from special branch with as critical as possible and as cynical as possible interpretations of Jeremy Corbyn's life and events that took place. Merely by trying to insinuate a proximity between Jeremy Corbyn and Walter Rodney, Tom Bauer was able to demonize Corbyn in the book. And the idea was that while Corbyn was in Jamaica, Walter Rodney was in Jamaica at the same time. And the exact words that Tom Bauer uses, as not paraphrasing, is we have no proof that Jeremy Corbyn and Walter Rodney did not get together and organize while they were both in Jamaica at the same time. So merely being in the same place as Walter Rodney and having that proximity mm. to anti-colonial analysis was enough to seriously, seriously demonize Corbyn. When we look at the policy of Operation Legacy, which has been written about extensively by uh, Ian Cobain in History Thieves, it looks at this uh, policy which um, uh, engaged several different levels of government um, in the destruction of uh, documents which evidenced what was happening during British colonial rule. And we're talking about in over 30 colonies, there was the destruction of these documents, whether the documents were taken out to sea and, and uh, dropped in the sea, attached to bricks, whether they were burnt, um, whether they were taken back here to Hanslope Park and um, invisibilized really by the British government. That operation legacy, that invisibilizing of Britain's relationship with the rest of the world for several hundred years has gone on on an institutional level and of course is present in schools. So the idea that thinking critically about whether it's the royal family or as you know those like Mark Curtis have pointed to um, probably up until recently seven covert wars being um, carried out by the British government around the world from Somalia to Syria and to other places Libya included that has all been invisibilized in the education system you have the prevent uh, program which directly works on minimizing the discussion of issues like that and worse than that putting young people into a pre-criminal space if they start to think critically about those things and I'm someone that has been informed by three different people one of them an educator one of them someone from prevent watch that prevent are using one of my videos in a training session that they give to educators in schools I don't know in what context, perhaps the video is used in the context of, oh, well, this kind of art is allowed, it's tolerated, or, and it's not beyond the realms of possibility, that it's used in those training sessions to say, if you catch a student watching this video, then they may be on that conveyor belt towards extremism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since finding out that, the video now has a, a warning before you watch it on YouTube it's slightly more complicated to watch. You have to sign in with your email account and you're informed that it has been identified by YouTube's community as um, offensive to some people. Mm. So, so, there's, so, there's that, an element, so there's an element of surveillance in art now. Oh, I mean, of course, of course, without a doubt. And, you know, from Paul Robeson being asked by um, the uh, Republican Party when he was here to turn against Roosevelt at the time of the New Deal, that and, and you saw what happened to somebody like Paul Robson. You know, three of the people that I really look up to in terms of in terms of the arts are Aziz Ali, a poet from Iraq who was active in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. Um, uh, Muhammad Mahdi Jawahari, another poet that was active um, in actually Aziz Ali was more active in the 40s and 50s. Aziz, um, Jawahari was active in the 30s, and Paul Robeson. These were people who made political decisions. Um, in the present and used their art and wielded it um, against the system which ruled them at the time. But all three of them died really unsung heroes in major ways. You know, according to Paul Robeson's son, there was an assassination attempt against his life and he, um, he died a recluse, you know. And Paul Robeson, let's not forget, was somebody that sang in over 11 languages. 
Um, he was definitely one of the most famous people in the world at one point. And he understood his solidarity when he went to places, when he went to Wales, for example, he sung for a group of Welsh miners. When he went to Australia, he went and sung for workers building Sydney Opera House. He understood where he saw his solidarity as lying. But a point that I also wanted to make when thinking about colonialism and the fingerprints it's left on the world, China was subjected to several opium wars whereby the British government and the East India Company wanted to force China to legalize opium, the selling of opium. You know, we can't forget that Forbes, the Forbes family, gained their wealth from selling opium in China, okay? The British and the United States made a lot of attempts to subjugate um, people in China. Now, let me ask you a question. In terms of the treatment of this pandemic, you have the Financial Times estimating that the real death toll could be 41,000 people. Mm. Would we prefer to live here right now, or would we prefer to live in former British colony China, where the death toll is a lot smaller? Would we prefer to live here now, or would we prefer to live in Vietnam, absolutely decimated by US imperialism, where they sent the US packing, escaping from the roof of the embassy, jumping onto helicopters from there, where the death toll is absolutely minuscule, if present at all. Would we rather live here or in Vietnam in these circumstances? Would we rather live here or in Germany right now, when you look at the death toll there and you compare it to it, you compare the amount of families that are losing people they love in comparison to the people here. Would we rather live in South Korea? Would we rather live in Japan? which was subject to nuclear weapons. War and imperialism is a self-defeating practice. It is short-termism if we're looking at human history as spanning at least, at very, very least 4,000 years in terms of what we see before us and what has been marked from engravings in stone to writing. Mm we can see clearly that this society, for whatever reason, hasn't been able to minimize death. The metropole has clearly been outshone by places that for a long time it was able to control economically and people it was able to punish. So, you know, like I say, if you were to have a government that was looking at a really serious, as uh, the, the, the Corbyn project wanted to do, was to have a, 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 an inquiry into the colonial legacy and the effect it has on the rest of the world, mm. but also curriculumize it, um, we'd be in better stead in understanding each other and in understanding um, how we all came to be in this, mm. in this position. As Martin said, also music offers and art offers solace for young people dealing with really trying situations sometimes. I think that we could also encourage more of a critical understanding of something like Notting Hill Carnival. You know, this was a product of the Windrush generation being told no dogs, no blacks, no Irish. And Labrook Grove yeah. being one of the only places that they could rent accommodation where they were by landlords like Peter Reckman and others exploited in terms of the rents that they were having to pay. But what happened was you had the Teddy Boys, you had people like Oswald Mosley trying to encourage um, targeting of them on the streets, leading to on the road, which is literally overlooked by Grenfell Tower, you had four days of rioting in 1958, um, where houses that it was believed that people that had come from the Caribbean were living in were being firebombed. A year later, you had Kelso Cole Crane murdered on the streets of Labrador Grove. And obviously, with the uh, involvement of Claudia Jones and others, you had the Notting Hill Carnival coming out of that repression of, you know, and Gaminda Bambra says it far better than me. She said Britain didn't have an empire, Britain was an empire. So it's that understanding of people that, number one, were not immigrants, they had. Um, under the British Nationality Act of 1947, um, the right to exercise their birthright by going to the mother country.
country. This was the way it was spoken about. Um, and of course, that wasn't taken back until 1962. That wasn't changed until the Commonwealth Act in 1962, where you had, by the way, the Conservative um, MP, Peter Griffins, running on the ticket, if you want an N-word for a neighbour, vote Labour. Well, what mm -hmm. we often forget, not only did he win in that election, he now teaches at Portsmouth University mm -hmm. and is completely undisturbed. So that was the same year that the Commonwealth Act came back in and tried to retroactively strip people of British citizenship. But if we were to understand the Notting Hill Carnival as coming out of that, and I say that as someone that lives in Lapa Grove, unfortunately, it's been cleansed of that quality, of it being a victory march of people from the colonies and former colonies who are asserting their presence and celebrating their culture in the face of personal violence and state discrimination. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can add those things into our education um, today, we will be able to understand the present far better. Yeah, I, I completely agree with everything that you said and that every point in history that you've highlighted, it has been artists that have pushed forward the movement for resistance. And I always say that whenever you look at a particular artist, they are the truest, um, they're the truest form of interdisciplinary scholars you will see. You've got history, you've got politics, you've got linguistics, you've got drama, all collated into this one identity called art so the final question i want to ask all three of you is what is the challenge for artists today in the current climate that we see within the uk what is the challenge for artists of all forms that in what in terms of what they need their work to be able to do right now i'm going to start off with martin hmm you know i i don't know maybe because i'm getting older i've never actually made money as an artist because it's never been that that's never been my pursuit um i used to as a younger artist say speak truth to power i now say speak your truth to history so i think for me preservation of your well-being preservation of the people that love you because i'm fortunate that what's kept me going for 50 years is a community that paid for my wedding a community that when i was in hospital was there so i've i've always felt that i'm not very good at many things i'm, I'm awful at most things but what i'm good at is telling stories and what i realize is i've always felt like a quarterback in an american football team where the community has been very protective mm -hmm. so for me and I, i'm speaking for me personally it's I've always been embedded and immersed in, and if you're isolated from that root, then you can, that isolation can drive you all sorts of ways. But for me personally, I am because we are, we are because I am. And I am the original, the whole village raised me. So for me, I just want to say people have a sense of community, even if it's a community of one, but, for me, it's community, community, community. Well, Desiree. Thank you, Martin, you superstar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think it's kind of like a bit of a two, two layered question. Um, thinking about art today, I kind of, uh, having taught, some kids that come out of school I kind of worry about the state of art in education and what happens what's happened and I think that's what uh, Martin has said quite well already in Loki too that I teach young people who seem to have not have lost their imagination because education has kind of drilled it out of them they come to me kind of make up a story they're like what what do you mean how do I do that where do I start I think that's very difficult and um, and, I, and I, I worry about the denigration of art in a way and that somehow it's not as important as say maths and English and all the other stuff. And I think we have to go back to a point where art is as important. Um, 
So that's one level of thinking about education, back to what you were saying, Muna. Mm -hmm. um, I also think um, that art in this country is very, very particular. I think sort of black art and art from people of color is always, it's always African-American art, really, when we're talking about here. Um, and how, how art is funded is, it, here is particular, it's particular to here. Um, that kind of proving your worth on an application form and what that means. Um, I'm totally against it. And I think that art needs to come back in some ways to the state, but then who controls the state? So it's another thing. Um, uh, but I also think that art now, like people who are making art, who are funded for art, people who's on the TV, they're all, it's all very middle class. It's all privately educated people, very male. Um, and I think we've lost something and that the education system has directly affected how art is viewed, what art is made, what art is funded. And so therefore, um, there's, there's ways that we have to revolutionize how we deal with art. Um, and I worry about that. I think in terms of what I do with people, um, working with people with learning differences, working with people who see themselves as somehow not attached to art when we make art the everyday, as opposed to something that's in a, in a massive um, lottery funded building that we think about, you know, my, my lemon cake is art, let me tell you right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I try and kind of, I try and tell people about art being part of their everyday life, not something that happens to anybody else, but happens to them all the time. And that art is important. Whatever your art might be, be that whatever, whatever that art might be, that your art is, is as valuable as anybody else's. And I would encourage people who are in school right now to read if you want to and look at stuff, because it's not just about reading. I do a lot of stuff around graphic novels too, but to think about, um, to think about art as, as not just your expression, but also your right. And when you're told that you shouldn't do this and you can't do this, your voice is, is as important as anybody else's. And me um, being how old I am and recognizing like, like Martin, where, where you're at, at a certain point, you see them and you think, all right, so you, Whatever you're going to do, whatever you're going to produce now, know that you have a right to produce it. Um, and I think that's really important to get across and, and, to, and to read other stuff. Read Camus Braithwaite, you know, read Zora Neale Hurston, that kind of thing. Mm. Thank you. Loki? So what I was going to say is I just wanted to talk quickly to one um, point that Martin made about speaking your truth to mm. history through art. Now, um, Picasso painted a picture of the bombing at Guernica. Now this was the first time in Europe that bombing from planes had taken place. The first time it took place um, overall was in 1911 in Libya when the Italians bombed Libya. But in 1930s you had Franco's forces backed by Germany and, Italia and, and Italy bombing, uh, bombing Guernica. And Picasso's depiction of it was so powerful, it was so powerful that when the uh, Nazi occupation of France took place in the Second World War, he was asked by a, um, a Nazi officer about the painting, did you do that? To which, Frank, um, to which uh, Picasso replied, no, you did. Now, the way that this picture has spoken volumes throughout history is so strong that when Colin Powell had to give his speech at the United Nations in which he was trying to sell the Iraq war to the rest of the world. That picture, which is across uh, the, 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 the kind of ceiling of the Security Council was covered with a curtain mm. because the understanding of that juxtaposition between the killer and the killed, mm. which is put in that uh, painting, was too much for even the US government to have. So this is art which was um, done in the 30s, having some type of say in the political realities of 2003, somehow still being dangerous. And so it's that that I really want to communicate to people, is that the struggle today, especially for art which challenges power, is being heard because the capacity for blocking it and for ghettoizing it outside of earshot 
is where it has never been previously, despite, despite the fact that the internet gives us a kind of um, uh, an illusion of a, a democratized space where all art is visible, all art, all art is audible. You actually have powers to de-emphasize it algorithmically, which are more advanced than ever before. So the point I want to make to people is that you make that art now, and in 50 years, it might have importance. And you know they tell us that resistance is futile, but it's not, it's fertile. And what you're doing when you're making this kind of art is planting a seed for a tree that you might not sit in the shade of. And that is the key to it, you know, that you will be planting a seed for something that other people that come after you will be able to benefit from. The same way that we have benefited from Martin and his generation, the sacrifices they made, the music they put out there, the generations, which I'm, I'm not sure, Mona, how we, um, <laughs> whether we're part of the same generation, but the generations that come. We're, we're part of the same music. generation. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> good. But the people that come after our generation will also benefit from the hard work and the challenges that we took on today in the present. You know, if it wasn't for uh, the people that wrote about the killing of Kelso Cochrane, we may not even know that Notting Hill mm. Carnival was linked to the killing of Kelso Cochrane. Was it not those that wrote about Bob Marley and his um, influence on Jamaican politics at the time and the power that he had? We might just consider him to be the could you be loved Bob Marley that, mm. that was associated with um, all things um, quite apolitical, really, in a way. So mm. it's important for us to historicize that and use the art to historicize things correctly too. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm going to echo a point uh, that Desiree... Just... Oh, go on, Martin. Sorry. I just want to say one thing. I yeah? feel very blessed. Desiree mentioned Edward Braithwaite. Edward Braithwaite stopped in my house for a period. I'm fortunate that in 50 years, I've spent time with probably 20 of the world's greatest writers. Some of them have gone. Some of them are white. People like Alan Plater. Many of the people I grew up with in radio drama in particular were very famous but were coming to the career. And they always used to say the elder books. And I grew up at a time when there was no internet. It was just libraries. It was dusty rooms. Um, and what I discovered is by sitting with Edward Braithwaite, um, I actually did a workshop when I was 16 with Ngugi Wathiongo. Um, Wallace Inca, I've been in a workshop with him. I've been in workshops with Alice Walker, Gil Scott Heron. I performed with The Last Poets. And in some respects, The Last Poets in particular, the time that I spent with them, and then I met Gil Scott Heron and Mike Smith, is, this, is the basis of humility. Because when I was growing up, I thought I knew it all until I heard Amiri Baraka. I met Amiri Baraka. So what I'm dealing with is what, I, what I've had to learn, and I still learn, and it's in reverse, because whereas I learned from a lot of people older than me, when I watch Loki's performance, and I know Desiree's work, I'm kind of going backwards, because I'm trying to retrace my steps, because when I was growing up, I kind of forgot, as I got older, of what we did. So what I'm saying is, I've gone back, and I'm re-looking at everybody from Stormzy, from Loki to Wiley, from Grime to Hip Hop to Drill to Trap to Garage, and then locating that 40,000 years ago, and then looking at um, the, the great Persian stories. And, and what I've realized is, is the key thing for me is to never, ever stop learning. And I feel, although I've been a teacher and I've been that wise person, I actually spend a lot more time now as a pupil. But there's a lot of things as you get older that you don't understand. And so I kind of feel blessed that I've learned a lot from older people. But I have to say that for people like yourself, Desiree, Loki, I'm learning that it's, I'm very close to that time now where I can actually let go. Because what I realize is the legacy that I always wanted to pass on most of that's been passed on and so therefore i can now just begin rather than say i'm going to go through the torture ordeal because it's art i'm actually finding comfort in looking at foxes out my back garden 
and seeing mm. the grass grow and listening to the sound of water. And that wouldn't have happened if the past and the future gave me permission to say, you know something, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's all right, because I can mm. see the fertile ground that the next generation are, 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 are coming with. Mm. I think, as Desiree said earlier on, this discussion has been so full and I think that's the best description for it. So takeaways and pieces of advice for um, artists that are listening in. Build a community, as Martin said, and, and speak your truth. Not, your, not only your truth to power, but your truth to history. Um, be your art and hold your voice. As Desiree said, try and be as authentic as possible. Um, Loki, talking about the importance of creating a resistance that is fertile. What, the, the truth that you speak right now may be challenging to be heard and to be seen but there will be a time when it is heard and seen and that will be the right time for it thank you guys so much for your contributions i'm in awe of your work and i really do appreciate you joining me this afternoon for just an amazing conversation thank you guys so much all right then thank you and goodbye everybody and i hopefully we'll see you again soon all right all right, thank you so much, Martin. It's nice to hook up and see you again. Lovely. Well, let's not leave it uh, so let, long. <laughs> so long. All right, so enough love. All right. Keep doing what you're doing. All right. All right, take care, all. Bye bye. Bye. Is Loki still there?